All right, let's do Ben Shabibo on on. Uh, here is here's Morgan. Morgan. Says it. Well, that's quite an intro we've given you. There. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. You that. better live up to it. I, well, I mean, I look at that old tape and it, suddenly I hit puberty, right? I mean, like, that's... <laughs> we both look so young. Oh my god! Uh, I mean, Please nuke Hoscord. Thank you for the ten gifted years. subs. I will not be nuking Hoscord. I will be running the top of the hour ad break, however. Years ago, right? Ten years ago. And it was interesting because I was at the time, you know, getting very pee. Uh, angry about a, a series of mass shootings in America with a British sensibility and saying, you know, obviously my country, we don't really have any guns. And I was, you know, hectoring and lecturing, I guess, Americans about their gun laws. And it went down as badly as that phrase would suggest, particularly with, with you. But what was interesting was when, I, when you came on, I thought, who's this snotty little kid <laughs> who's going to start trying to take me on? And then it rapidly became clear to me you were a hell of a lot smarter than you appear. <laughs> um, so uh, we've moved on from that. Anyway, we've, we've had our, our kiss and make up interview after that. But I I, I think what was pretty interesting to me, 2016, so seven years ago now, you tweeted a, a tweet. This is your pinned tweet to this date. Simply said, facts don't care about your feelings. And if any phrase, I think, perfectly epitomizes this woke era that we have somehow stumbled into, it's fat. Because the woke brigade put feelings before facts. How do we get there? Well, I mean, I'm, culturally speaking, I think that what happened is that the value of subjective authenticity became the core to pretty much everybody. So the, the idea of individualism was taken to its logical extreme, which was, I'm so important and everything I feel is so important that I can ignore the rest of reality. And in fact, reality is an imposition on me. Institutions, rules, roles, the rules of the road, all that sort of stuff, it's an imposition on who I truly am. And in order for me to be actually free, I have to speak my truth. Now, you know, as I've said and you've said, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as my truth, right. right? There's your opinion and then there's the truth. But as soon as you start speaking in terms of my truth, as soon as you start saying, well, there's how I feel about the world and how I feel about the world is the core of me, what that also does is it means that other people are aggressing on you when they disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Because obviously a shared reality means that we can disagree about things out here, but you know, we sort of as human beings are intact. But the moment that you start to identify your truth with the truth, then anybody attacking your truth is attacking you as a human being. And I think that that's where we've gone, is, is this movement away from, we're having a political debate, but again, we can go out and have a drink afterward because we are, we are not the political debate. The political debate's a different thing. To my politics are who I am, or my right. feelings about who I am, or my feelings about the world, that's the thing that matters more than anything else. And what's extraordinary? I mean, I remember this. We're going to come to them later, sadly. But Meghan and Harry, <laughs> when they went on Oprah Winfrey. The issue is that, like, Ben's quote-unquote truth unironically revolves around, like, harming marginalized communities further by, one, denying systematic oppression uh, and its existence, and, two, Asking for more of it from the government. So, like, it's not about, like, you know, the truth. I mean, if you want to talk about the truth that Ben denies regularly, it's systemic racism. It's the truth that systemic racism exists. Ben denies it all the fucking time. He does. He tries to reduce it down to individual actions. Oh, there's no such thing as systemic racism. It's only just individuals that are racist. That's not the case. Yeah, this motherfucker actively says that God cannot make bad laws and perce perceives to justify God's truth. Yeah. Not to be too much of a Reddit atheist, but the facts don't care about your feelings guy using his made-up religion to justify all those dumbass beliefs is truly astounding. Exactly. No, you're... I mean, it is true that that is a silly way to go about things. But, like, it's at the heart of his fucking arguments for abortion, for example, even though his own religion believes that abortions uh, are allowed. <laughs> Free. And she started talking constantly about my truth and Oprah was endorsing your truth and everything. I was like, I'm living in a sort of mad world where truth is no longer factual. It's just whatever you're feeling in any given moment. It seems That's not the case, dude. Thing. Oh my God, dude. I'm sorry, but like conservative motherfuckers love crying about their feelings more than literally any number of like uh, gender critical uh, taking college freshmen, okay? It's literally all of their feelings all the time, non-fucking stop. They never shut the fuck up. They're currently doing it. They're crying about their feelings about 
the rest of the world not coming to terms with their understanding of the truth. That's literally you crying about your fucking feelings. Thing for a democratic society that you move away from fact based, from science, whatever it may be, to just feel like nobody wants to move away from fact based shit. They just made that up. He is 100% right. Ben is so good. Love him. That's a lie. True. Like, who? Who wants to move away from a fact-based society? You think it's the fucking guys that talk about climate change? Okay? A scientific consensus that 99% of scientists believe? Or the fucking dudes that are like, no, it's actually fake because I'm being paid by the oil lobby. Who's trying to move away from scientific truth? The people that believe in evolution? Or the people that think that it was Adam and Eve? Who? Who's advocating for moving away from a science-based society? Shut the fuck up! It's mind-boggling to me that these guys have dominated the space so aggressively with their full-court press that, like, while they simultaneously destroy books and remove them from public libraries and shit, they make it seem like it's the libtards that want censorship. Ben Shapiro advocating for anti-BDS laws has the audacity to fucking claim that he's a free speech defender. That's wild. And so many suckers are duped into believing it as well. I trust Ben over... No, don't ban him. He said I'm overly emotional. He trusts Ben over overly emotional people like myself. Because emotional men are blind and cannot see the truth. Oh, totally, dude. Totally. I'm an emotional, I'm an overly emotional man. Ben Shapiro, on the other hand, is not emotional at all. Ben Shapiro cries every fucking episode about trans people existing in society and how that's destroying and eviscerating the fucking West and moral, moral degeneracy is actually destroying the West. You just agree with him, you fucking idiot. It's not that he is not emotional. It's just that you agree with him. So you don't recognize it when he brings up issues that are complete fucking fabrications. Based, he doesn't scream and cry like you. Yes, he does. And also, you're once again showing that you are nothing more than an animal. Okay? Are you an animal? Do you have no capacity of understanding the words that are coming out of my mouth? You only can look at shapes and colors, and like the visceral reaction that you have is all that matters. You fucking dingus. You donkey. That's just the self-report that you're a stupid person, that you, unlike most human beings, cannot comprehend anything when you hear someone speak in ways that you don't want to hear them. You're like, oh, well, you're being a little emotional about like, I don't know, trans people being fucking uh, uh, legislated away from existence. Like, yeah, that's uh, okay. I guess that undermines my point then. No, it doesn't. You, unfortunately... You, unfortunately, are too stupid, and you're admitting that you're stupid. You're doing the thing that conservatives do all the time, vice signaling, okay? You're signaling about your vices, and not only that, but you're also signaling that you are a fucking stupid person. Why are you so mad, bro? Chill. They just have a different opinion. I love the secondary take that uh, immediately comes into play here. Why are you so mad, bro? This is not just a different opinion, Okay. I'm not just talking about a difference in opinion here. I'm yelling at a chatter or thinking that it is a virtue to be a donkey. Okay. It is not a virtue to be a stupid person. Yeah. You say a whole bunch of nothing. You say a whole bunch of stuff that has no meaning behind it. No, I see. I say a lot of things that have meaning behind them. You're too stupid to understand it, unfortunately. So I urge you. Okay. So I urge you, please. Please just take a deep breath, okay? Take a deep breath. You're with us. You are blind and cannot see. Okay, stop. Just stop writing shit in the chat and just take a deep breath and listen to the words. And maybe then, instead of spitting out reactions like a fucking chatbot, you might be able to comprehend some of the things, at least some of the things, not all of them, but at least some of the things that I'm bringing up. Feelings dominating a culture and if you defy those feelings you are instantly branded 
the enemy and you must be destroyed. Well, there's no conversation to be had, right? I can't have a conversation about your feelings. You're feeling your feelings. There's no way for me to dissuade you from You can't deny my feelings. Correct. I can't deny, <laughs> I can deny the facts that you bring to the table, but the problem is once that becomes irrelevant, then we're just at an impasse. There's no more conversation to be had. How big a problem is it that at the same time, simultaneously, I think, you've had the rise of very populist leaders like Donald Trump, Boris Johnson in the UK, uh, and others who play pretty fast and loose with the truth. That you have people who say, well, hang on, you talk about the sanctity of truth, but you've got these political leaders, US presidents, British prime ministers, where they don't seem to care about the truth. They just bumble through with whatever suits them from day to day. How dangerous is that to the whole shebang? I mean, I think that that is dangerous, but it's dangerous in a different way. And, and it's also dangerous in a more consistent and I would say historically uh, precedented way. I mean, the, the fact is that politicians have always fibbed to us. I mean, there, there's nothing right. new about politicians saying things that are not true, from from LBJ to to George W. Bush to to Donald Trump and Barack Obama. I mean, like literally every politician. And Joe Biden. I mean, yeah, to, to, to President Biden. Bumpers, yeah. Right? You see, you see this all the time. So the idea of a politician not telling the truth or shading the truth in particular ways, that that's not what's new. I think what's new is where people are presented with data, and their immediate response isn't, "Let me bring you some data that rebuts that data," but I don't even have to look at your data because your motivation is bad. That's not true. Ben Shapiro is once again arguing against the complete fabrication. He's arguing against something that's made up, which is ironic because like his side has Donald Trump who like doesn't even try to fucking massage the numbers. Ben is like a product of a bygone era of old school neocon conservatism that at least tries to like justify the American Enterprise Institute type conservatism, the Heritage Foundation type conservatism that tries to like find data or massage numbers enough or cherry pick enough to make it seem like there's actual data on his side. But like, that's not the case that, 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 that era of conservative politician died out regardless and no, as far as like science having a fucking bias or a slant, yeah, it's on the it's on the side of of uh, you know it's certainly closer to uh, liberals and the and the things that they talk about. So you know, I myself am not a liberal, but even I recognize that. Ben Shapiro loves your piker. Thank you for the five good the subs. This philosophy how, how, how dangerous is it, though, that we've also become incredibly tribal? I think more than I can ever remember in modern history, actually. You know, when I read your Twitter feed, I think you're always prepared to call out your own side if you genuinely feel there's been some egregious wrongdoing that they've done or a terrible mistake or whatever. But the number of people prepared to do that now on social media in particular, is minuscule. Most people park themselves into their tribe, whatever that tribe may be, and there is no moving them. There's no deviation. Even Yeah, I mean, it's two guys that agree with one another talking about how, like, the other side is just, like, they're, un they're unmoving. They're unshakable. It's just like, bitch, what about you? You're literally, you're doing it right now. And if the facts change, and again, it plays into, well, if your feelings are, are the facts, then if you feel that fact is wrong, well, that's enough. Right, but the, the tribalism that I think has... has cropped up is rooted in a philosophy called the motivism, which is the idea that everybody's actual viewpoints are not driven by their view of the facts. It's, it's driven by their internal emotions. Mm. What that allows me to do on the, on the converse what? is attribute malicious intent to people that I'm arguing with. Mm. And it means that I get to ignore all of their facts. The reason that, that I'm disagreeing with you is because I'm good and you're a bad person. And with Dude, I'm sorry, but like, I can't, this is so 2016 era, like I said, like this is this is pre-Trump. Okay? It's pre-Trump. Who the fuck is even claiming that they have facts on their side at this point? You know what I mean? Like Republicans don't give a fuck about that. They give a fuck about power. This would be interesting react content in 2018. Yeah. When a when a a, a younger Hassan would be like, "That's not true. The facts are never on your side, Mr. Ben Shapiro. The facts are actually on the side of uh, liberals, there's a there's a reality that has a liberal bias. Okay, facts don't care about your feelings, sir. What that means is that people on my own side, for example, they might be upset with me for talking with people on the other side of the aisle because why would you talk to somebody who's a nasty person who has bad motivations? And the same thing on on 
people on the other side talking to me. I, I was having a conversation one time with a very, very large left-wing podcaster. This is probably 2018. And I said, you know, we should really do like a crossover podcast for the midterm elections. We'll do huge business. And my side will be totally fine with it. It'll be great. And he said, your side will be fine with it. My side will kill me. Right. And that, that's probably right. But that's right. the way it's gone. And Bill Maher said to me, you know, that comedy used to be rooted really in, in right-wing extremism being comedic. And, and that was the, that was where liberal comics like him could, could get their material now he said it's mainly to the left it's the woke this is the, the yeah no that's another fucking old out of touch asshole no right wing extremism is still fucking hilarious definitely like it's still certainly hilarious are there rad libs that also fucking lose their minds in in ways that are vicious and also hilarious certainly i make fun of them too but this notion that it's like most comedy is coming from the blue-haired liberals blue-haired marxists or whatever like no that's silly as fuck area of politics that gives him the most comedic material and he can't believe it as a liberal himself he feels just really frustrated that they don't understand how ridiculous and laughable their positions on things have become. Well, it's, it's, it's driving a bunch of people who consider themselves center or center left into the arms of people who are more conservative, actually. Mm -hmm. I've made the point before that I think the future of the West may ride not. Yeah, what will the man, what will the fucking uh, what will the progressive movement do now that they lost Bill Maher? <laughs> <laughs> People who agree with me most of the time, you know, conservatives, traditionalists, I think the future of the rest, uh, West might, might ride on people who consider themselves kind of traditional liberals, who may agree with some of the left's prescriptions yes. economically, but who disagree with the way they want to get there, which is very often by silencing debate, using censorship, shutting things down. So the question is going to be, are they willing to put off utopia for a while in order to engage in the debate? Because I've, the always, thought, like myself, I've always thought myself not really as a political ideologue, right? I, I think I'm pretty centrist and call out everybody, really. I'm more, I see myself as a journalist. I'm Fundamentally, and don't think that being partisan helps that particular profession very much, as we've seen from those who've actually drifted down into being partisan as journalists. It doesn't work. You become an activist. Uh, but no, so centrism is not being devoid of ideology. Centrism is just literally whatever the ideology is and acting like neoliberalism, which is the dominant ideology, is not a thing. It is just a way of existence. Okay. There is no such thing. It's stupid. It just means you're you're advocating for the status quo, which, by the way, ironically, is what everyone is advocating for for the most part. People take the current way of existence for granted. They don't even think about it as though like it's bad or wrong. People that are like openly on the right want to pull it more to the right. Okay. People on the left want to pull it more to the left. The idea that like centrism uh, is a is a real viable thing is just you know it's not it's the it's just your your exactly centrism is just deferring to the hegemony exactly hegemony. I was the other day you know are you a conservative I said well I never identified as a conservative but the fa the farther lunatic that the left woke go the more the pendulum swings and eventually we all get sucked into thinking well okay actually by comparison to this I probably am getting a bit conservative because I think they're lunatics. I think what's happening right now, and it's happening in a bunch of countries, is people are just craving any sense of normality. And common and, sense. And no one is providing it to them. Right. No one is providing it to them. They're taking a, a slap at the people who are. Yeah, dude, you you certainly are providing normality. Mister, there is no such thing as a fucking non-living wage. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I always go to Ben Shapiro to understand what is really going on when he tells me that, like, the average American that's suffering from fucking medical bills or, or whatever kind of, like, unnecessary amount of, uh, you know, cost uh, of living increases, uh, all of that is actually bullshit because Ben Shapiro told me so, and I'm just not working hard. I should be working harder, Sigma Grindset style, and that's when I get my sense of normality from Ben responsible for the status quo as licensed to now do whatever they want. And so you're seeing the pendulum swinging wildly side to side, because if you're a political leader, you're trying to harness the passions of the moment to get done the thing that you really, really want to get done. When in reality, the population just wants things to kind of just stop. Just like, I mean, leave us alone and stop. He's reterming the fact that the reactionary politics is born from the left insulting their idea of what's normal. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. 
he Ben Shapiro constantly shits on what could be possible, right? Like a better future. That's how he makes his living. While simultaneously upholding inequality as the norm, and in many such cases, inequality is the norm, and a lot of people are conditioned to think that it is the norm. So, of course, that's the reason why he can get away with saying this is common sense, of course. Well, you know, not. Right, I totally agree. And I think, I think that's the majority of people, right? I mean... To oh, by the way, the, the, the best argument against that is uh, the appeal to nature fallacy. Mr. Logic and Facts, just like every other fucking debate lord, regularly utilizes logical fallacies. The idea that there is some... There, the idea that there is, like, human nature and that, uh, you know, we need to appeal to it, we need to abide by it, is, in my opinion, unnatural. The entire existence of humanity is by destroying nature. Like, there is no, there is no fucking uh, skyscrapers in human nature. You know, we built those things, okay? There's no such thing. There's no, like, no, no part of our lives is, is normal in comparison to the rest of nature. Not natural is not normal. Today, Rolling Stone uh, published a, an opinion piece on why cancel culture is good for democracy. And I read this piece and it was so completely deluded. Because of yeah, and then they find like some fucking random person that wrote something and then talk about it as though that's like definitely the... the as though that is definitely just uh, what every liberal thinks. No one likes cancel culture. It's not a thing. And the right weaponizes cancel culture regularly. Okay? The right loves using cancel culture. Lamau facts. Literally a Rolling Stone op-ed. Yeah. Every now and then someone writes an article about cancel culture or whatever. And then they go, oh, that's it. That's how everyone is. Technically, everybody loves cancel culture. Okay? And everybody hates cancel culture when it's done to them. Or to their side. But don't act like this is not a thing that uh, the right utilizes and the right utilizes it more efficiently and more effectively too. Of course, cancel culture is the antithesis of a democracy. It's actually the antithesis of liberalism. You can't pretend to be liberal with what that actually was intended to mean and support cancel culture. I think, I think the left uses cancel culture in a very different way than most of us use cancel culture. When we talk about cancel culture, typically what we mean is you say something that they don't like on the air, and they decide to secondarily boycott your advertisers, or they go to your bosses right. and call for you to be fired. Right. And th that's what we mean by cancel culture. What they mean is, well, we're allowed to disapprove of you. Well, sure, you're allowed to disapprove. Turn the channel. Right? You don't have to subscribe to right. Daily Wire. You don't have to watch your show. Right? But what they do with that instead is they attempt to get you kicked off the air, not by dint of lack of ratings or something, but just because they're so angry that they're going to go yell at people and bother them until you get kicked off the air. That, that's, that's what cancel culture really is. I interviewed Congressman George Santos uh, this week, who even by the standards of was... fibbing, <laughs> fibbing politicians, I mean, it was quite startling. I'll just play the clip where he admits to being a terrible liar. What? Oh, George Santos. Okay, that's awkward. <laughs> and it's truth to you now that everything comes out of your mouth or that you write is fact. I mean, it's it's the most important thing to me because I have to sleep at night. I mean, it, it's it's something that, that I try to think about as much as humanly possible is is never lie to your audience. Never right. say to your audience a thing that you know to be not true and try to follow this the best data possible. And that does mean that you're very often having to be more nuanced than, than sort of the politics of the situation may allow. Because the easiest position in politics is always to take the the hardest right or the hardest left position, the sort of most pure, most easily understood position, or to just play the easiest game of all, which is, again, my opponent is a bad guy. My opponent is a person who hates when, when we had our, our dust up at CNN about gun control. Yeah, Ben, on the other hand, he has a lot of nuance, dude. That's why he advocated to... Uh, that's why he claimed that the, the, the fucking uh, civil rights movement was fraudulent, you know? Just... That's why he thinks the government should not interfere in private businesses stopping black people from entering their premises, which is a very real nuanced take from Ben Shapiro. You know, that's not the furthest right wing take he could take. Technically, he should he could advocate to like just straight up kill black people on site. He doesn't do that. So I guess he's not he's doing a, a, a nuanced uh, position on it. 
example, for example, I'm not going to go over all that mm -hmm. again, but had I been very different with you, if I'd been very, like, respectful and said, look, I'm a British guy, these aren't my laws, I'm just ho as horrified as you are by these massacres, and didn't talk about gun control, which I think has always been a terribly inflammatory phrase for many Americans. They don't want to be controlled. And they certainly don't want to hear a British accent telling them about how, how yeah, there should be more control. But if I'd phrased it as about gun safety... If that had always been the debate in America, how do you make it safer in a country that has 400 million firearms in circulation? Would that have been a more constructive debate, do you think? I think it would have been a more informative debate. And the, the reason being, I think, that clarity is, is very much opposed sometimes by, by passion. We, listen, we all get passionate about these issues. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm not passionate on my show or I'm completely dispassionate mm -hmm. in all circumstances. I'm obviously not. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that would have allowed for the kind of discussion where we could have looked at data from various areas of the world. Where, where have regulations been effective? Where have they not been effective? What are, as I said on the show, actually, at the time, I believe, like, what are the risks and rewards of particular policies? That, that's where the good discussion area, I think, gets done. Have you yeah, except you never have that. Like, everything Ben is talking about, about how the left is or whatever, is exactly what he does. And the only time he brings up evidence is when he's cherry picking shit to disingenuously frame an argument like if he truly cared about the data he wouldn't be advocating for the side he's advocating for do you agree with literally anything ben says or i mean i don't know probably not It'd be very hard i'm sure there's something i agree you i mean just final point on the gun thing but it and i'm aware many viewers who watch this in america own guns and support yeah, I own guns, the yeah. Second Amendment rights and so on. Where do you see the, the line going? Hasn't been shown data before in uh, debates? Yes. That's why I said he loves to cherry pick data. Like, uh, what did he do the other day? We were watching a video and he, and he almost slipped up and then he turned around. Like, one common trope is like uh, using the totality or the majority uh, instead of per capita arguments, because per capita arguments usually betray, whenever you talk about like American statistics, people love to use totality rather than per capita. Um, because America is a very large country is a very wealthy country. So of course, by a lot of metrics, we spend more money than other nations, right? On, on a lot of shit, right? What was it? What the fuck was it that he was like talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rate of black arrests. Yeah, I remember. No, I think he said the rate of, or did he say a higher rate of white people are killed by cops? And then corrected himself and went, I, I mean, a higher number. Because, you know, he almost accidentally fucking revealed the truth. When we talk about the, the uh, argument about, like, black people being over-policed. Yes, black people, or sorry, yes, police kill more white people in this country. Okay, that's true. There are more white people in this country. But police kill black people at a disproportionate rate, a much higher rate. That's the problem. And when we bring that up to talk about the disparity in policing... Ben doesn't want to even bring that up because that's a harder argument to uh, argue against. As you have all these massacres and as gun ownership incre increases, there's more guns in circulation. What do you do about that? I mean, as a, as a country as big and powerful as America, what more can be done to just make it safer? I mean, uh, again, I, the, the measures that I've always suggested are measures that tend more toward the gun owner than, than toward the, the weapon itself, mm -hmm. meaning that we obviously need better screening procedures for people who have a history of severe mental illness. We have to—we have red flag laws on the books, but they're not enacted. I mean, people, people don't actually right. practically right. follow the red flag laws, which is why I'm kind of skeptical of the idea that if we pass some more text from the legislature, that's magically going to translate into, into better action. What we need is more alacrity from the cops. I mean, how many of these mass shootings have we seen where there are— News isn't red my flags, algorithm. And the cops okay. go to the house and then they're talking. Bro, here, the argument that you're supposed to be making in this regard, if you want to talk about like black people that are doing more crime or whatever, is the common trope, the 1350 trope. According to FBI arrest records, 13% of the population, black people, 
are uh, getting are, are are responsible for 50% of the arrests. Now, of course, the reason for uh, why that is is over policing to begin with. So, if you want to make a better argument to be a better racist in the future, you can at least come to me and say, "Uh, try arguing against FBI crime statistics, libtard." Okay, and then to that I respond, "Well, the re- first of all, those are arrest numbers; they're not conviction rates." Okay. You're so bad at debating that I'm debating for you. Those are arrest numbers, not conviction numbers. An arrest does not mean conviction. Black people are over-policed on top of uh, getting arrested for false charges way, way more frequently than fucking white people. As a matter of fact, if you look at real studies that pertain to, let's say, drug usage, for example, black people and white people use drugs, weed, let's use weed, uh, at the exact same rate. As a matter of fact, sometimes white people use weed at a higher rate than black people. And yet black people get arrested for minor possession charges at, I think, four times the higher, four times higher rate than white people do. This is a consequence of over-policing black people. It's a consequence of things like stop and frisk policies. It's a consequence of racial biases in the way that uh, policing works and operates in the system. Black people are also given longer sentences for the same kinds of crimes that white people commit. Okay? Before we even talk about the other side of systemic racism, like redlining in the Jim Crow North, racism in the Jim Crow North, or just straight up segregation in the Jim Crow South, if they didn't commit the crimes, would they do the time? You are failing to understand the words that I'm using. So there's way more white people, but white and black people use the same amount of drugs? No. At, a, at the same rate, at the same rate, at the same rate as in, or let's say every one, like rate, meaning 10 out of every 100 black person, 10 out of every 100 white person. So if we were, if I were to say the totality, then yes, there would be more white people that are, uh, you know, consuming drugs than black people. That's not what we're talking about. Oh my God. Okay. Anyway, um, if they didn't commit the crimes, would they do the time is not an argument when we are talking about two groups of people that are doing the same crime at the same rate and one group of people getting longer sentences and getting arrested, uh, uh, getting arrested at a higher rate. Okay. That is where disproportionate policing comes from. That's why we say black uh, neighborhoods are occupied by police forces. Okay. They do the same time for the same crime. No, they do not. As a matter of fact, sentencing disparity is also, uh, absolutely a part of the law. The sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and just straight up cocaine exist existed. So even that's not true. That that's not even true. You're not understanding what I'm saying to you. Okay. I hope this is an educational I hope this is an educational moment for you, okay? That you just understood what I... I hope you understand what I'm saying, okay? You can't argue against law, man. I mean, that's true. Can you give me an example of a black person being sentenced longer than a white person for the same crime? You are, once again, looking at individual examples. Individual anecdotes do not... Do not... Is not an adequate substitute for data, Okay? Of course, I can give you an example of a black person sentence being longer than a white person for the same crime, but that wouldn't mean anything because the way to disprove that, again, the way to disprove that would be to give you an example of a white person doing a longer sentence than a black person for the same crime, but that wouldn't actually prove the point, would it? Okay? You have to look at empirical evidence. You have to look at statistics to to get a full scope of the picture. Okay? Okay? Young black and Latino males tend to be sentenced more severely than comparably situated white males, which means from a similar economic background, unemployed black males tend to be sentenced more severely than comparably situated white males. This is analyzing crime and sentencing data to give you this outlook, to give you, uh, to, to give you this as evidence, okay? And this is from 2005. It's fucking, you know, that, <laughs> but... Doesn't that mean that black and Latino males are committing more crimes? That's why they're being sentenced more? No chatter. Okay. I'm close to fucking losing my patience. It's the same crime. It's the same crime. They're doing the same crimes. 
They're not doing more. It's the same crimes that they're committing. You have to be trolling, right? Do you not understand this? Yeah, as for the look around you, the news and media show more black crime than any other crime altering perception. Absolutely. What does it mean then? It means what I've told you it means. It means that white people and black people, when factoring in their socioeconomic conditions, as in like where they are in life, okay, when factoring in the crime that they have committed, are doing the same crime, but not doing the same time. Because the criminal justice system somehow, for some reason, okay, keeps giving longer sentences to black people. That somehow, some reason, is systemic racism. So who got a longer sentence than a white man? You didn't give an example of that happening. Oh my God. This is an example of that happening thousands of times. This, okay, a study is kind of like not one example, but like thousands of that example put together. Do you understand? Do you know what a study is? Do you, do you know what that is? It's like a bunch of anecdotes that they put together and compiled so that they could get a better understanding of how uh, systems work because we are unfortunately very biased, okay? And anecdotes can be clouded by bias. There's many different biases like recency bias or maybe you see something a lot in your fucking immediate, uh, uh, you know, Twitter uh, feed and you think that that is the case. So we look for an adequate sample size and that's how we conduct a study. Exactly, just one example. You know people make up studies, right? Exactly, just one example, please. Bro, you don't even have a study. If there's thousands, you should be able to name one easy. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, no, no, no. He's, he's baiting me. He's, he's, uh, he's, he's baiting me. Okay, never mind. It's almost in every circumstance. So we actually do need law enforcement to have more ability and will mm -hmm. to carry out, for example, when they know somebody is severely mentally disturbed or somebody is shooting a gun at their mother, which we have we've had a case like that. That would be a time where you actually remove the person's guns and, and keep track of them, make sure they can't actually get guns. Right? I mean, See, if I had my way, again, when I was doing that debating, I would have had this kind of conversation. I can look back at those and realize I was only my own emotions override we all have these i mean <laughs> yeah but it's interesting isn't it I, I do think an important part of how we get to a better place as as society now away from this tribalism away from all this stuff is you've got to be prepared to have this kind of conversation which doesn't end up with me just looking at you and shouting well you're a complete idiot because you don't agree with me right um it's more complicated it's more nuanced life is more nuanced than that I, I like to think so. And I think that, again, those conversations can be really, really productive. I try to make a habit. I have my regular daily show, mm -hmm. but I also have a show called The Sunday Special that you've been on, yeah. in which I bring on a bunch of people who disagree, from Bill Maher to Anna Kasparian. Yeah. And we actually try to talk through these issues. And I people, lost some of and I people... found it a very surprisingly pleasant experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a short break. I want to come back and ask you the, I mean, the most deadly question in the world right now. What is a woman? <laughs> Welcome back to Pittsburgh. Oh, here we go. Yeah, he's like, let's talk about transphobia. Uncensored live from New York. Ben Shapiro is live and uncensored. So come on, then. what is a woman? Well, I mean, a woman is whatever J.K. Rowling says a woman is. Right. <laughs> and uh, she's right. A woman is a biological human female. How on earth have we got to a place where stating that simple fact has now become a stick to beat people with? When, from what I can ascertain, 99% of the entire planet agrees with that fact. Yep. Again, it goes back to that idea that your subjective feeling about yourself must be reflected by the rest of the world, cheered and celebrated by the rest of the world, because that's that's actually what the ask is, right? The ask isn't even, you know, I wish to be treated well in society, and you can think whatever you want of me, but you should treat me decently. That, that's not the actual ask. The actual ask is, I wish for you to participate in a delusion whereby I am a biological human female, or exactly the same in many important respects as a biological human female. Trans women are women, which, again, if you refuse to define and what you've warned about this, and I've warned about it, and we've taken it to, we said in the warnings. It doesn't seem like he's describing what a woman is, though. It's so funny. They never do. They're like, a woman is a woman. A biological female. Okay, what is a biological female? And whenever you ask them that question, they're like, okay, well, chromosomes. And then you're like, okay, is Ann Coulter a woman then? Yeah, she is a woman. Okay. Inter 
high likelihood that uh, I think isn't she intersex? I think she is. I don't want to fucking. Ben definitely doesn't know uh, what a woman is anyway. <sighs> but um, a chatter actually correctly pointed this out. Um, saying that you're a biological female already, already gives the game away. You're talking outliers that represent 99.9% .9 of the population. No, that's not true. It's not 99.9% .9 of the population. Okay. And it doesn't matter. You can't just say something is an outlier and then act like that's not, um, act like that is a biological reality. Act like that's outside of the scope of biological reality. They can't parse gender and sex, so Ben's argument is dumb just from the assumption. Yeah, I mean, if if gender was uh, was was not socially learned, okay, if gender was not socially learned, and it wasn't like super, fu if gender wasn't social, then you wouldn't have to separate it and say biological gender, biological sex. Jewish people represent a small portion of society, but you wouldn't say they're not significant. Exactly. Also, uh, I think, wait, isn't that actually the same number? The number of intersex people on this planet is more than the number of Jewish people. The number of intersex people on this planet are the no more than the number of, um, the, the, uh, number of redheads. If we're going to talk about like biological, Okay. More women than expected are genetically men. Sex chromosomes usually determine whether you are female or male. Women are XX, men are XY. However, genetically, few women are actually a few women are actually men. They grow up as women with a woman's body and mostly only discover well into puberty that they are different. Danish researchers map the first time how many women are genetically men. The proportion was higher than expected. The intersex estimate is 1.7%. Um, Jewish people make up 0.2% of the population on the planet. Also... As far as gender goes, that's an expression. You want to know why? Don't make me play the game again. Or I'm going to pull, pull up fucking Buck. And numerous uh, other trans people to be like, is this a man? Is this a woman? And then you go, oh, that's a man. Oh, guess what? That's a trans man. That kind of thing. Okay. The reason why you... You would lose that game if we were to do that. Let's not with the trans medical is though. I know, I know. It's just to open the door up. It's just to open the door, okay? It's to open the conversation. That's not the end all be all of gender, okay? But that's a good way to just peek in and open the door for transphobic people to understand that gender is, gender is a expression, Imagine going on a date and then you sit down, a woman is sitting in front of you, you go, I need to see your chromosomes to make sure that you're valid, that you're a woman. You don't do that. If you take this to a logical conclusion, it's going to get abused. And we had a stark example of this in Scotland several weeks ago with this rapist, Adam Graham, who at his trial, having raped two women, with his penis, and let's be graphic her, about her, it. her penis. Well, this is the point. Yes. He, he then turned up as Isla. I hate that. Like the only time will they're like where where they will like listen to the fucking expression or listen to the gender pronouns that someone wants to be called by is when they're talking about one specific example of a fucking rapist. This is so vile, dude. It is so fucking vile, and it totally gives the game away okay even if this person was truly a trans person which i don't think they are okay i don't know what the fuck's going on here i'm not familiar with this case because i don't follow every fucking uh i don't follow every goddamn last uh you know issue of trans criminals magazine okay they are committing a crime Men, men, you know, assigned male at birth men, cis men, are responsible for the bulk, the overwhelming majority of pedophilia, okay? That does not mean all men are automatically, all cis men are automatically pedophiles. The controversy for this case was that the rapist said they were a woman, so demanded to be in a woman's prison.
a Bryson and said, I'm now a woman. So that's him before. And then he comes along as Isla Bryson there. And the, the game plan, according to his ex-wife, is well, he just wants to get into a women's prison, which is obviously what his game plan was. <clears throat> and he got into one, uh, put into a women's prison where there are women there who are vulnerable to attacks from people like him. Um, that, to me, showed the insanity of this. But we had a, a leader, Nicola Sturgeon, been leader of Scotland for eight years, who supported this limitless gender identity nonsense and lost her job, actually, I think, as a direct consequence of this. Yep. I mean, let's see what she said. I'll, I'll play it to you. The question is, are all trans Look, women women? This you haven't is, answered that question. Well, that's not the point that we're dealing with that's here. That's the question I'm Trans women are, are women, but in the prison context, there is no automatic right for a trans so woman. So there are contexts where a trans woman is not a woman? No, there is... <laughs> there is circumstances in which a trans woman uh, will be housed in the male prison estate. I think that interview cost her her job because when I watched that, it went on for about 50 seconds. It was jaw dropping because actually her ideology about this was, was just cruelly exposed as being completely. Yeah, I know. Men get raped in men's prisons as well. Uh, but that's not the point here. I don't know enough about this case. I don't even know enough about this particular case to give an adequate assessment. And the only thing I can tell you is that. These bad faith insane dudes wouldn't think to do this if this hadn't become a culture war. Yeah, literally. Like, that dude, that dude, okay, saying, oh, I'm a woman now. Like, fucking put me in a woman's prison. Uh, no shot to put a rapist in gen pop. Exactly. It doesn't even fucking matter um, because there's no way that they're getting into gen pop. But... <coughs> That person coming out of the gate swinging and saying, like, I'm a woman now. I was, I was always a woman. Is a new phenomena that conservatives brought to the fucking fold. Women literally get raped by other cis women in women's prisons. What the fuck is their point? Yeah, exactly. Nicola Sturgeon is stepping down due to stress and shit. She did not lose her position as first minister of Scotland. They don't care about the trans woman being worshipped in men's prison. You think they decided to put him there to, on purpose to create this controversy? No, Scotland is actually uh, way more, uh, way more understanding and way more fucking woke when it comes to trans issues than the rest of uh, the rest of the islands or the rest of the UK. But I don't know. Now I have to look. At, oh God! Now I have to look at this case. I don't even know what the fuck it is. God damn it! I hate this shit. This is the worst part about shit like this is that like you have to be up to date with like every new fucking psycho that comes out oh they they lied scotland did not put this person in a woman's prison the law says that the determination is made on a case-by-case -case basis as in this case where they were oh oh my god oh they just fucking straight up lied well i would not have expected them to just fucking lie dude what the fuck Newly convicted or remanded transgender prison inmates will initially be placed in jails according to the sex of birth. Scottish Prison Service has confirmed. The policy was confirmed in an urgent review, which found a double rape is being placed in a women's jail. Did not put female prisoners at risk of harm. However, the SPS said that it received conflicting details on Isla Bryson. It also called for an urgent review of admission rules for some inmates. The investigation was ordered by Justice Secretary Keith Brown of the wake of public outcry. Bryson, who will sentenced later this month for raping two women while she was known as a man adam graham was then moved to a male wing at hmp edinburgh in an interview with bbc scotland mr brown initially said the rule applied only to transgender people convicted of violence against women but after an invest intervention from a member of his staff the justice secretary clarified all transgender prisoners will go into an assessment prison service facility which matches their sex of birth oh so just why does it like guys a youtube clickbait title is a little bit different than fucking pierce morgan straight up lying about a fucking f important fact that literally completely changes the the argument that he made like it changed the entire story it's not just a clickbait youtube title dude what the fuck are you talking about that is actually fucking insane i i was not i, I would not have expected pierce morgan on his own show to to lie to this degree what is this zizek talked about this too 
Did you check what the actual fuck? At least he's going mask off about hating, not understanding queer and trans people, so we don't have to guess anymore. Oh, what? Zizek wrote about it? At many gender cl clinics across the West, doctors feel compelled to adopt an unquestioning affirmative approach. With little regard to the underlying mental health crisis troubling children, the pressure is, in fact, twofold for nothing. Clinicians are cowed by the trans lobby. <laughs> the trans lobby. Which interprets skepticism regarding puberty block as a conservative attempt to make it more difficult for trans individuals to actualize their sexual identities, compounded by a financial compulsion. More than half of Tavistock's income, for example, came from the treatment of youngster sexual troubles. In short, what we have here is the worst combination of politically correct badgering with a brutal calculation of financial interest. The use of puberty blockers is yet another case of woke capitalism. Basically, you declare what you feel you are and you are registered as you want to, what you want to be. Is predictable problem emerged when Isla Bryson, a biological male convicted of rape, was rem remanded to a woman's prison in Sterling. But that's not even what happened. That's crazy that Slavo is... I mean, it's not crazy. Slavo Zizek has always uh, been... He does do shit like this all the time, from time to time. In my opinion, that doesn't undermine the rest of his work, but this is definitely this is definitely a common uh, Zizek take. It's not even surprising to me that even he fucking uh, did this because I mean, Pierce Morgan just duped me. Also, the Roald Dahl books, <laughs> all having this sensitivity reading, I mean, uh, first removing of all, hundreds and hundreds of words and phrases from this from this you know iconic author. He's three, sold three hundred million books. Suddenly, they're rewriting this stuff, and some of the rewrites were so completely ridiculous. One where tractors are referred to as black, they had to change that. Because somehow you can't have a black tractor. Well, what if the tractor's black? I, I, one of the real problems here is that the modern context cannot understand why kids would read Roald Dahl. That really is the major issue. Right. So I, I read, I read Roald Dahl to my kids. I just got through, I think, pretty much his entire right. corpus with my six-year-old. And it's a move to make more money. No one was asking for this. Yeah. What the fuck? Where is this from, dude? I, I can't keep up to date with all the like fucking weird shit that. Uh, liberals do changes to the new editions of rolled doll books of readers up in arms okay new editions of the legendary works by british author rolled doll are being edited to remove words that can be deemed offensive to some readers what dude this is always some shit that the publisher does there no one even asks for it this is the same fucking shit with uh what's his face Jesus Christ, it's just marketing, man. You guys are, I, I hate having this fucking conversation so many times over. It like doesn't do anything. They did this with Dr. Seuss too. No one asked for it. They just did it on their own. And then you do that and people get mad and then it drives more fucking book sales. And the irony of course is that like everyone is playing a role in the marketing campaign. The character Augustus Gloop and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory is no longer called fat. Instead, he's described as enormous. Who, no one asked for this. No one. Not a single person on the level was like, we need to do this, okay? I don't get it. I don't get why this is a point of contention. This does not change your life at all. I'm Norwegian. They're removing words like ugly and stupid and fat. And for the witches that wear wigs, they added a line saying, even if the witches weren't bald, they could wear wigs. What? Oh, none of this matters. None of this matters. This is all fucking lib shit. And they are liberals in the same way that these guys are. The witches, even if she's working as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman, even if she's working as a top scientist or running a business, I can't do this. It's just like people are so fucking bored, dude. They just like manufacture bullshit over and over again. It's a fucking lie. No plans for doll text changes from US European publishers. Wait, they're not even doing this. They just made it up. No, they did it in the UK, not in other territories. I've seen too much. I don't need to see anymore. I'm taking my glasses off. I don't need to read anymore. I've read too much. I've seen too much. I don't want to know. It's just like, so they did it only for the UK. And they're not doing it for the US. 
which they shouldn't have even done it for the UK. Who does this help? Nobody. Like when you get gifted a sub at the top of the hour, at least you're helping chatters. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm I'm done. I can't. I can't. I don't want to do this. It's like it's like hurting my soul. I'm not gonna. Want to-